Hello everybody, my name is Morgan Jameson and I'm one of the grad students here and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about bilingual aphasia and some of the treatment options there are for it. So just to start off, um, a quick background. According to the census, about one in five Americans are bilingual. So for speech language pathologists and audiologists, this means that every fifth person who walks through the door is going to speak a second language in addition to English. So it's really important that you have some background in treating bilinguals. Now bilingualism has a lot of different definitions, but the one I prefer is a person who is bilingual is somebody who uses two or more languages in a variety of contexts within their daily life. So that can be somebody who uses one language for school and one language for work and one language for at their house or somebody who uses two languages all the time. The variability is infinite, but that's basically what bilingualism is. So in terms of learning two languages, a person can be simultaneous or sequential. And a simultaneous bilingual is somebody who learned both languages from birth, basically. So somebody like my brother-in-law, he grew up in Switzerland, he learned German and Italian starting from birth, he would be considered simultaneous. Whereas somebody like me, I learned English from birth and I learned Spanish starting at age 14, I would be considered sequential. So, moving right along, in terms of the neurolinguistic models of bilingualism, there's um, three sort of big major theories out there um, that regarding where the different languages are stored in the left hemisphere. So the first theory is the localization theory, which says that both languages get their separate parts of the left hemisphere and there's no sharing whatsoever. And then the shared theory says that both languages are stored in the same spot in the brain. Now the more popular and more um, accepted view is the amalgamated theory which says that there is some areas that are shared between two languages and that there are some areas that are separate that each language get, gets on their own. And then where um, the separation occurs and where it's shared, that's still up for it. Pretty much the jury is out on that in terms of the research. So, um, as I said before, the amalgamated model is the most accepted model by the academic community. So it uh, says that both languages are still localized in the, less, the left hemisphere or the dominant hemisphere. But typically what we see with, um, with this is that the amount of sharing varies based on the sequential versus simultaneous. So people who are simultaneous, it tends to be that L1 and L2 share more than they're separate. And then for somebody who's sequential, it tends to be that there are some shared areas, but there are a lot more separate areas than there is in a simultaneous bilingual. And like I said before, there's still a lot of debate over where the divisions occur. Some argue that it's morphos in morphosyntax, some in semantics but the jury is still very much out. But in terms of treatment, we, use, we tend to use this amalgamated view of the brain because when something like a stroke happens, it, it has a big effect on um, which language is impaired or not. Now I know that um, this week the lecture kind of has beaten aphasia to death, so I'm not going to talk too much about the nuts and bolts of aphasia, so I'm going to assume you all have a background on it, but I am going to talk about the recovery patterns in bilingual patients, which you can get some really kooky recovery patterns. So the first one is parallel recovery, which this one's pretty straightforward. So the language, the recovery of languages parallels the premorbid relative abilities. So that means if somebody starts stronger in, let's say, English than they are in Spanish, after they have their stroke, they're still going to be stronger in English than they are in Spanish. So that's parallel recovery. The differential recovery means one language is recovered much better than the other compared to pre-morbid abilities. So let's say you were equal in Spanish and English before your stroke. Well, afterwards, you might be stronger in English than you are in Spanish. So it's kind of one ends up better than the other. Now this one, the next recovery pattern is sort of the strangest. It's called antagonistic recovery. And this is when one language is initially available and then as, the, as that language, uh, as the other language starts to recover, then the initially available language starts to decrease. So let's say 
somebody after their stroke they start getting better in English and English starts showing up again well as you start treating Spanish then English starts to go back down and disappear and then Spanish all of a sudden is really good again and then within antagonistic recovery you can also see this thing called alternating antagonism which is when it goes back and forth between you know one language gets strong and then the other one gets strong and then this one gets strong and then this one gets strong again and this alternating antagonism it can happen in 24 hours or it can happen over a few months but it'll just keep on doing that and then um, there's blending recovery which this is a little bit confusing it's kinda of sounds like code switching which in excuse me in typical bilinguals code switching is when you mix the two languages but you do it on purpose and you know what you're doing hmm, excuse me in blending recovery um, the patient is mixing the languages but they think they're speaking one language so if the patient speaks English and Spanish then and they're having a conversation in English they'll throw in Spanish but they don't know they're throwing it in and they don't know that the other person can't understand them so in this way it's kind of like Bernanke's aphasia where the patient knows or thinks that they're they're making they're speaking intelligibly but really they're speaking in gibberish but they have no idea that they're speaking in gibberish so it's the same thing it's they have no idea that they're not speaking the correct language and they just mix it in intermittently and then there's selective aphasia which is which also can happen in bilinguals and it's when language loss in one language with no well, there's language loss in one language with no measurable deficit in the other so let's say um, you speak Japanese and English beforehand, then all of you you remain speaking in English, but Japanese is gone. So that would be selective aphasia. It's like the aphasia picked one language over the other. And then there's last but not least, there's successive recovery, which means you'll get one language back and then you'll get the second language back. So again all these are running under that assumption of that amalgamated view and they kind of support the amalgamated view because depending on if you're simultaneous or sequential and depending on where your stroke is and what kind of stroke and what kind of aphasia you're experiencing if it's you know transcortical motor or transcortical motor or if it's global then that's when these recovery patterns come in so if you're stronger in L1 and you have a certain type of aphasia you might get blending recovery so it all depends on that so when it comes to intervention with bilinguals and assessment uh, it's really important that you consider the patient's bilingualism so when you're picking goals it's really important that you've discussed with the patient how important it is for them to speak each language so in terms of function if they work in a in a job that speaks English then they might want to work on English more than their other language or if they want to be able to talk to their grandkids in their home language then you might want to work on the home language first so it really it's very important that you get sort of a baseline for that and then when you're doing assessment it's important to consider how your assessment tools were referenced so if the norm reference population isn't bilingual then that test is obviously not going to reflect um, accurate scores for the patient so it's really important that you picked um, assessment tools that have a normed population that are bilingual and that are ideally of that culture so you have to one of these tests is the bilingual aphasia test and this measures a client's ability to use each language so it doesn't say anything about loss but it tells you how much is left over after the stroke and that's really important to identify before you go on to treatment so in terms of treatment the research is really still in its infancy in terms of bilingual aphasia and treatments that target two languages and that promote outcomes uh, generalizing across languages and within a language so, but um, one of the treatment options out there that I find most interesting is when you take a treatment and you target the similarities of the language because that goes back to the amalgamated, amalgamated view so you're trying to target the areas in the brain that are shared so in theory if a certain skill is left over after a stroke in one language it should be left over in the other if that's a shared area so Lawler and Kishner they did this um, study back in 2001 where they looked at cognates and 
their argument was that um, the brain organizes the two languages morphosyntactically. So if you think of your brain as a filing cabinet, um, if, ugh, sorry, if you think of the, your brain as a filing cabinet, uh, it's going to put similar word or si morphologically similar words in the same file, and that goes for monolinguals and bilinguals. So in a monolingual, words like tomato and tomatoes are going to be put in the same file, but in a bilingual, you're going to have tomato, tomatoes and tomate y tomates in the same file. And then words that are semantically similar are sort of next to each other in the file cabinet. So, so tomato would be by other foods. So if you think of aphasia, it's like somebody is stealing a file. So in theory, if the file is left behind, then it, both languages should still be intact there. Like that goes back to the shared view. So in terms of treatment, if you try to target those similarities, you should be able to see improvements in that language and improvements in the other language without treating it. So one good example is Catherine Connor did a study in 2004 where she treated a patient using cognates, which cognates are like tomato and tomate, and the patient did better when you used cognates than when you didn't use cognates. So he got better she treated him in Spanish and he got better in Spanish and then he also got better in English when she used cognates but not when she didn't. So sort of the take home message here is that when you're treating bilingual aphasia it's really a good idea to go after those um, similarities between languages and this doesn't just have to be cognates, it can be syntax, it can be semantics, so an example with syntax if the language if both languages are subject, object, verb that's something you could you would want to target in therapy. So I hope this has been helpful and have a very happy finals week everybody.